Before we uh, get started, I was just advised in the last few days that Spark actually won a national award for its logo. that's collaborative and is also adaptive. 
Uh, classic strategic planning is something where you do something at a point in time and then it goes up on a shelf and nobody ever looks at it again. We said, no, we don't want to do it that way. We want to do it in an adaptive way because higher education is changing so fast. We need to be able to pivot when changes take place and uh, our strategically we need to be able to pivot as, uh, as uh, changes take place. And so our paradigm for moving through this process is to include as many people as possible, as much to the organization as possible, and to be able to do it in a nimble, adaptive way. However, all strategic planning kind of falls into the same kind of phases. I mean, you, you plan, you scan, you determine where you are, you, determine, you plan, you determine where you want to go, and then you implement well. And that's our scan, plan, do. Where we are right now is right here. We are just about finished scanning, and in 2019, we will be planning. And um, I'll let the teams talk to you about it, but the, the, the most difficult part for your teams was to not immediately go to planning, is to really sit back and objectively look at data, look at evidence, and see where it is we are right now and what it is outside where we need to go without trying to solve the problems. And uh, the teams had wonderful ideas, but uh, their team leaders have been constantly holding them back until the, until the planning phase, where now they can start uh, talking about strategy. So that's what we plan to do in 2019. And um, this is the whole process here. So this is a process map that shows where we are right now in the strategic planning process. We are done with the red phase, which is basically planning to plan. Uh, what we've been involved in and, uh, in the fall is the scanning phase where we look at our internal environment and our external environment. That's the green phase, and that's what we're wrapping up right now. Where we're going is the purple phase, where we're actually going to do some applied benchmarking, some research. We're going to gather more uh, information from engagement sessions and data to figure out, OK, these are the issues that we need to address. And this is how we, the strategy that we want to take to address it. A strategy is just a plan of action, right? A tactic then are smaller pieces that each of your assessment uh, units would engage in to say how you're going to do it within your specific department. And so the purple is where we're going in uh, 2019 in planning. And then uh, the blue represents implementing in January of 2020. And so uh, to really authentically engage in this process, it's a monumental effort. The leads have done a wonderful job in leading their teams. Uh, and um, we still have more work to do, though, in, in the spring. We want to make sure the president is behind some of these strategic issues we're going to share with you right now. And um, so we, there's some um, synergy and integration that needs to go on there, but uh, I think that this is the, the plan that we would follow regardless of who the president becomes. I think it's a pretty good process. So um, just to get you familiar, what you're going to hear right now is the teams, the teams have been uh, occupied with assessing the internal strengths and weaknesses and the opportunities and challenges that face Wake Tech. And uh, so they did something called a SWOT analysis or a SWOT analysis. Everybody heard it here of a SWOT analysis, SWOT analysis? Uh, they looked at data. They uh, got input from um, engaged employees through deliberative dialogue engagement sessions. They looked at research in order to assess what are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and challenges. And then what they were asked to do, which is not always understood, or, or it's, it's the hardest part of strategic planning, is to, based on those assessments, what are the key strategic issues that face Wake Tech? What are the key things that if we don't address these, that, that it will be a problem for Wake Tech? Uh, what is it that will keep our senior administrators up at night if we don't address these issues? And we received guidance from um, uh, Bryson, who uh, has great uh, literature on how to do this for nonprofits. Um, and, um, that guidance told us to frame those strategic issues as questions, okay? Because when
when you frame a strategic issue as a question, then it prevents some of those early on conflicts on uh, debating how to do it. We just have to determine what it is that we have to address right now. The teams also, this was a huge learning process for them, and I'd like to commend you for leading your teams and your teams, because not only did you have to learn the process in one semester, but you had to apply it and produce something from it. And as you know, working with me, that it's never easy. So uh, I really appreciate, uh, I, I think, learning, uh, teaching somebody else to do it, and then applying it to make a product is very hard. And I just want to give that to you. But um, I think we learned a lot, and I think the institution learned a lot. And you don't learn anything without a lot of hard work. In, in my experience, I've never learned anything a lot, unless it's really hard. So um, I learned a lot, too, and I learned a lot from you. So uh, what you're going to see, what they're going to talk about, is each of the priorities, what the vision is for that priority. And then they're also going to talk about the strategic issues that they identified through data and evidence. And they're going to explain why they said they thought it was a strategic issue and what happens if we don't do anything about it. All of these strategic issues will be combined into one report and redistributed to the uh, management councils on campus. So uh, the uh, Curriculum Education Services Council deans will look at it, the uh, Enrollment and Student Services deans will look at it, the ENI Council, and they will have a chance to look at these strategic issues and say, hmm, are these, you know, are these the top strategic issues? How would I prioritize these strategic issues? Knowing that all of the data that went into identifying them as strategic issues, and then the college will prioritize them themselves. So we'll come out, what you'll see is about 15 to 20 strategic issues. We'll probably whittle those down and combine them. You're going to see some similarities between them even right now. So we'll end up combining some of them at the end. But uh, they're going to have a chance to talk to you about uh, what it is that makes it important to their team using their frame. Okay? Any questions so far before we uh, get started with these? Okay. Well, presenting first is the learning team. Emily Moore is the team lead for that. Um, Beth Lewis has uh, agreed to present for Emily. She's sick. And so, uh, Beth, go ahead and uh, thank you for presenting for uh, Emily. All right, so Emily Moore is the team lead, but before I get started with the learning priority, I want to recognize the, the team members for the learning team. So any team members or consultants for the learning team who are here today, if you could please stand up. Yay. And I just want to say their names. Uh, John Bakken, Brandy Blanchard, Maria Fist. Sister, Tanya Green, Jessica Kessler, Andrea Ledesma, if I butchered that, please tell me. Um, Debbie Manis, Andrus Paul, Jimmy Smith, Tom Rankin, Jackie Swanick, uh, Diane Albahari, Tyler Dockery, Brian Johnson, Sharon McMillan, Tracy Rowe, Amanda Sinotis, Angela Smedley, and Jason Whitehead. So thank you all for your hard work. All right, so for the learning priority, a little bit of background. Um, the charter for the learning priority explained learning uh, and the importance of learning being one of our priorities as ensuring that students gain the knowledge, skills, and abilities they need for the labor market and transfer. And so the purpose of, I mean, our purpose at Wake Tech is to ensure that students have good learning outcomes while they're here and that they uh, secure and obtain the knowledge they need uh, to be successful in the workforce or when they transfer. So I'll talk a little bit about the learning teams. I'll try. There we go. Okay. So my understanding is that these are in order of priority for the learning team. The first strategic issue is how can we connect students with the resources they need to overcome academic, social, and economic barriers? And so my, uh, based on reading the uh, draft of the SCAN report for the learning team, uh, my understanding is that they picked this one based, of course, on the SWOC analysis and the details that they obtained 
uh, regarding the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and challenges during the engagement sessions. And so, of course, if we don't connect students with the resources, the uh, conflict there, the, the consequence is that students may not uh, have the information they need to stay here. So it could interrupt completion. If students don't know, for example, that we have um, uh, uh, you know, resources for food security, if they don't understand that we have tutorial help. Um, so providing them that information is essential to their success and staying in their classes at Wake Tech. Another uh, key strategic issue is how can we enable faculty and staff to use effective pedagogy and emerging educational technology to increase student success in online, hybrid, and seated classes? And so, as you all know, we've already made strides uh, to this here. We have Epic, we have um, uh, I believe it's called Tala. We have a lot of things going on right now that's already helping with this, but this is something we need to continue to grow and build based on this write-up from the learning team and based on the data and the information received during those engagement sessions. Of course, if we don't do this, we're not going to continue to grow uh, as a college and continue to help our students um, uh, develop as they need to. And then also, number three, how can we create a culture of innovation and transparency that empowers faculty, staff, and students to take risks and generate solutions? We all know that Wake Tech uh, uh, prides itself on leading the way. And so a consequence, if we don't continue to do this, continue to grow, is that we may have an issue with uh, abiding by one of our slogans, leading the way. So we want to make sure that we continue to be innovative and on top of it. Um, and then finally, how can we develop and strengthen relationships with external stakeholders in order to increase student success at Wake Tech and beyond? And this, I, I would think, is also key. Yes, they're in order of priority, but here is something that we can continue to grow and develop. And based on reading the, the report, uh, if we don't do this, if we don't continue to develop relationships, especially with perhaps workforce, we may halt our growth, um, we may stunt our growth, and we may also damage our current relationships if we don't continue to support and foster those. And so that's the, the information I have, and I guess we're holding until the end for questions. Now, learning team, did I miss anything? I want to make sure I appropriately represent you. Good? Thank you. So I'm Barb Coles. I'm the co-lead for the completion team. Uh, Allison Consul was the co-lead, my, my co-worker, partner in crime. She is now busy with the presidential candidate selection, so she's not here. Thank you. Um, uh, I see a few members of the completion team in the audience. Would you mind standing? and receiving the clap that you deserve. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Mwah. I, I, there you go. I really appreciate you helping us through this semester. Okay, so our goal for this whole semester was scanning and seeing where we were, or where we could improve in completion because the more students who complete, the more letters you have after your name, apparently they pay you more money. Then you have more money, you have a better life, hopefully. Okay, so um, we're, we looked at how to get students to increase their credentials as they leave uh, Wake Tech. Okay, so we came up with, four seems to be the magic number for everyone. So we came up with four strategic issues and um, in priority, they're on the board. Uh, one of the uh, major ones is how can we continue to increase the rates of our graduations with degrees and certificates? Um, I know recently with um, Brian Ryan and Kai Wang, had that wonderful little program to help boost certificate um, acknowledgement. So thank you for skewing our data. 
but <laughs> at least we've got more certificates awarded, and that's good. Um, so our job's done. Goodbye. Um, no, <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, a number of things with this, um, a lot of students don't realize that there are certificates available within their programs. Um, and, and that's a, a major concern that uh, we hope next semester under the SCAN is that we help increase students' awareness of these available certificates and other de uh, degrees and programs they can jump into, okay? Take health science, I, I, okay, we're on health science. You know, everyone wants to be a nurse. I want to be a nurse. Everyone's not cut out to be a nurse. But they think that's the only thing in health science they can be. It's like, um, what about the medical lab technology? What about medical assisting? What about radiology? There's something out there for you to be in health science. There's something out there for you to be instead of the computer programmer, you know, or, or the big fancy job that everyone's going after because supposedly they have more money, okay? So if we could increase the students' awareness of these avenues that they could take and be just as successful, I think our completion, we think our completion rates would, would increase, okay? Now, everyone thinks there's a straight path to where you end up, and there's always diversions, okay? Um, if it was just a straight path, our life would be boring. <laughs> okay, so the other bit of this that we wanted to increase is advisors knowledge of those bridges going to other programs. Okay, because advisors, they go and they see the students, you're not doing so well in your bios, okay? What's going on? You're not doing so well in your English, what's going on? Is there something else we can get you into, okay? So if they would know and know the other options or know who to send them to for the other options, that would be a big plus on trying to get students to stay at Wake Tech and complete at Wake Tech, okay? Um, the, another uh, st uh, strategy for this one is develop programs of study that are connected to the workplace, for example, require an appropriate level of math class, math, whoop, whoop, <laughs> and not one more advanced than what is needed for the job. Okay, so they should, okay, medical assisting does not need to know calculus. <laughs> they do need to know how to add and subtract, but they don't need to know calculus. So why should calculus be on their program of study? So kind of bring down, you know, the requirements, make it real life, you know. Because what, what did we always ask in high school when you're in history class? What's this, why do I need to learn this, right? It's like, to be more well-rounded. <laughs> well, I like that answer. <laughs> Math always repeats itself, though, right? <laughs> so that's okay. <laughs> I love math. <laughs> I love math, Sharon. I love math. <laughs> and Sharon. Okay. The, <laughs> the other thing, um, one of the barriers that a lot of our students run across, uh, especially in the applied, is the costs incurred with the programs, okay? Um, one key thing here on health sciences, dental hygiene, their first semester, they pay close to $1,000 in instruments. Their second semester, they have another set of instruments to buy just as costly. Not everyone knows that till they're sitting in here in orientation. And they're like, oh, where am I going to get this $2,000 from? And they're like, well, we split it in half. It's like, well, it's still $1,000, right? Um, automotive, they're tools that they have to buy. You know, the craftsman and the rusty stuff won't work, right? So if we could somehow, somehow, look into alternative measures to have cost-effective 
uh, uh, items associated with these classes, I think they'll be able to stay in a lot longer and finish. Um, for the biologies, right, um, the lab kits, for the online, the lab kits, four or $500 additional, okay? Um, always, everyone, oh, I'll take the online, I'm like, be careful, it's four or $500 more for the lab kit. And they don't realize that, okay? So if we could cut those back, and, and maybe open educational resources is an answer, I do not know. Um, I tried an open educational resource for one of my classes, and they ignored it just as well. <laughs> so they just didn't have to pay to ignore it. <laughs> but you know, the, we're, we'll, we've got a curve to, to conquer. We've got a little hill to conquer with that. But I, I think that's a good thing to possibly focus on because, you know, students are paying to come here a lot of them are still working. They don't have the money, that extra money. You know, a biology textbook costs too much, too much. As sure as all the English books, the math books and everything. So if we could eliminate that or decrease that, that burden on them, I think they'll be able to stay longer and finish. Okay, so um, it kind of mushes all together. So excuse me if I somewhat repeat or just breeze over the rest. Okay, so um, the second question, how do we better prepare advisors and provide quality tools for them to advise their advisees? Now this is not just the official advisors in student services, it's the faculty advisors. A lot of uh, faculty here on health sciences and the programs, they are advisors um, to the students in their programs. And as a former instructor, I was approached, and I know all the instructors here have been approached at one point or another saying, hey, what do you think I should take next? You know, so they are um, not official, unofficial advisors. So we all need to know or have some sort of knowledge of what's, what's out there, okay? What, what tools are out there? One thing that would help tremendously that we found as we were going through all of our engagement sessions, no one knows everything that is being offered at Wake Tech. And it's like, oh, I didn't know we had that. Oh yeah, it's up on North, we do it all the time. I'm like, hmm. And then, oh, I didn't know we had that. Oh yeah, we do that at the high school. You know, they do that, that pulse at the high school. Why don't we do more integrative, aggressive advising, you know? So there's a lot of issues, there's a lot of programs out there that's available that we don't know exist. It's like we don't know what we don't know. Dr. Boo? Um, I'll take his. Well, Or 
that that good ideas. I'll uh, definitely keep that in. As soon as I sit down, I'll write that down. <laughs> All right. Uh, so number three, how can we reduce motivational barriers and provide promising interventions? So again, this is the, I want to be a nurse. I'm failing out of nursing. Well, where else can we find you? A spot, right? Like, like Miss Benita always says, where's your spot on the bus, right? You got to find your right seat on the bus. Maybe it's not in nursing. Maybe it's in MLT. Maybe it's in automotive. Maybe, maybe it's in graphic design, who knows? Okay, so let's find your spot. Another thing um, that we had this, uh, a potential here, the motivational barriers, uh, financial aid barriers, um, registration, advising, uh, kind of the, you know, there's a, uh, we, got advisors on our completion team they're not here because they have been swamped the last month you know um, trying to get people registered for a class that starts on January 4 um, so you know how do we make this smoother this whole process smoother for them the self-service is a great start however a lot of students don't know how to work it and I have to tell you I had a hard time working through it with my baby sister because she's come back to Wake Tech to get a, pro, a new degree. And I'm like, oh, sure, there's that self-serve. And I'm like, oh, my God, where do I find this? And, you know, so it is not a, it's not 100% user-friendly. So we need more user-friendly stuff, okay, for our students. Okay? Thankfully, I think my baby sister's got one of the best advisors in town, but... <laughs> I digress. <laughs> All right, and lastly, how do we reduce the structural barriers preventing students from reaching their ac academic goals? And um, it's not so like sidewalks and whatnot and buildings, but more of the food insecurities, um, the uh, scholarships that are available. Now, many people know that just this year, uh, Duke Health has a sponsorship for medical assisting students. So 10 medical assisting students will be sponsored by Duke Health. They have practically been adopted by Duke Health. Tuition, books, scrubs, anything and everything they need to complete this year program. And then they get a guaranteed two-year employment. They get a job afterwards. It's guaranteed. Not many people knew about it. So trying to get that word out. Again, we don't know what we don't know. And if we had some centralized place where we had something set up where we say, what's available to me? What does weight tech offer that would apply to my situation? And I know we got tons, 74,000 different situations, but they've got to overlap. Okay, somewhat overlap, that we could have a centralized area of what's available to our students. And we reach out and help them. They're going to stay, and they're going to complete. Knock on wood. Thank you. All right. So before I get started about transfer, could the transfer team stand up, members of the transfer team? Let me give them a round of applause. I will tell you that many members of the transfer team are in service areas of the college, like advising, and they are swamped right now. And we also have several faculty members who are currently giving exams. So thank you for both of you for coming. I just want to say their names so that you all know. Ian Brown, Scarlett Edwards, Deb Hadley, Diane Hagler, Harriet Hoover, Greg Johnson, Abby Littlefield, Shannon Imbudry, Sherry Naren, and Sharon Welker. And our consultants, Jacinta Allman, Philip Jefferson, Marsha McCoy, Susan Mearden, and Kelly Murray. So I just want to thank them for their incredible work this semester. Um, as Carrie said, this is definitely a large task, but it has been a pleasure working with the transfer team. Um, so our goal, we focus on our transfer student population, of course, because transfer is our priority. 
But what we focused on was their success while they're here, but also their success after they transferred to a four-year college and university. So our ultimate goal is to create strategies that will help support and ensure the success of Wake Tech students once they transfer to that four-year college or university. Okay. So our strategic issues, and like Barb said, we have four, and these are in order of priority. And so the first one is how can we effectively communicate four-year college and university program major requirements to Wake Tech's transfer students, given that the requirements are frequently changing at each institution? So um, something that we talked a lot about, we did a number of engagement sessions. Of course, we had faculty and staff engagement sessions, but we did a huge number of student engagement sessions. And one thing that students kept saying time and time again was that the, the policies and the procedures in terms of major requirements keep changing and I can't keep track of them. And so, you know, I, I feel like I'm taking the right classes and then I learn that the major requirements and my intended major once I go to NC State, they, those have changed and now I'm wasting time while I'm here. I'm gonna have wasted credits. And so, a little stat for you. Um, the non-transfer graduation rate for the UNC system was 87% in 2013, but Wake Tech students' bachelor's completion rate was 77%, 10% lower than the native UNC system students. And so we wanted to focus on why that was. We realized that's, that's an issue and something that we need to focus on. And we think, based on our research and hearing from everyone, that this difference is likely due to transfer students taking classes at Wake Tech that misalign with their intended major. And so that's the first strategic issue. And so we said that if we didn't address this, um, we would really be potentially causing problems for our transfer students down the road. They will likely continue to take more than four years to earn a bachelor degree. They may drop out of college altogether due to financial reasons wasted credit hours, and so on. Okay, our second strategic issue is how can we steer transfer students toward four-year colleges and universities that provide the best chance of success given that for-profit colleges have more aggressive advertising strategies but low retention and success rates? So one thing we discovered is that Strayer University was one of our most popular transfer institutions at Wake Tech, number eight out of 10. However, out of the Wake Tech students who attended Strayer, 0% completed with a bachelor's degree, which is a really big problem. And so these for-profit institutions have a big advertising budget and they're very aggressive with their advertising strategies. If you come here, you get a free laptop type thing and that can grab students' attention. So through our research and through those engagement sessions, we realized that we really need to as an institution figure out what it is that we can do to steer our transfer students in the right direction in terms of where they're going to go for transfer so that they don't pick an institution that has a low chance of success for them. And so uh, that's something that we hope to brainstorm next semester in the planning phase. Um, and I will say that according to the National Bureau of Economic Research, and this was interesting, Enrollment at for-profit colleges led to more loans, higher loan amounts, and increased likelihood of borrowing and worse labor market outcomes. So of course, if this is not something that we don't focus on or address, transfer students might be roped in to going to the wrong institutions and end up harming the economy ultimately in debt, having issues getting jobs, which would be of course problematic and against our mission and goal. Okay, strategic issue number three is how can we strengthen and expand our transfer partnerships and best prepare our transfer student population for academic success at four-year colleges and universities, given the academic support needs of an open-door admission student population? So, of course, at Wake Tech, we don't have admission requirements in terms of academics. And so we have students, and if you all are teaching, you know, with extremely varying levels of ability in the classroom, yet our transfer courses need to be comparable to those at four-year colleges and universities. So how do we do this? And so that's something that we've been talking a lot about and hearing a lot about during these engagement sessions, is how do we reach this student population, maintain the rigor, rigor in our classes, but also ensure that we are not providing a false sense of security 
with uh, the professor and student in the classroom and what's to come once they transfer. So according to our research, transfer students from community colleges, they often experience academic difficulties within the first year after transferring because they experience something that people have called now transfer shock. So in other words, transfer students are often used to student support strategies and small class sizes at their community college, and then they experience a more independent dynamic at the transfer institution, and they have a hard time adjusting. And so something that we came up with after hearing all of the feedback is, how, how do we fill that gap? What are some strategies that we need to work on to ensure that we are meeting the needs of our open door student population, but also successfully preparing them for that transfer uh, for your college environment once they transfer? And of course, if we don't do that, we will probably see a continued decline in student success there. They may become overwhelmed and have a, an issue uh, feeling like they belong at that institution um, if we don't address it. And then the last strategic issue that we honed in on was how can we create a campus culture or environment that engages and prepares Wake Tech's transfer students, given that Wake Tech is a multi-campus commuter college? And so you're probably thinking, what does that have to do with transfer? But something we heard time and time again during these student engagement sessions specifically was students are hungry for a uh, more dynamic campus culture or environment at Wake Tech. Of course, we don't have dorms. We don't have student living on campus. But students are hungry for some sort of uh, uh, social environment on Wake Tech's campus. And students also are tired of squirrels. That was something else they said. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> with squirrels and parking aside, a big focus was, hey, we need to have something on campus that makes us feel like we belong here, like we have some sort of social element or connection here. And so that's something we heard time and time again. And so we did some research. And it turns out, and I, I'm sure many of you know this, NC State, which is our top transfer institution, NC State now offers two-year associate's degrees. And NC State has a... Uh, of course, that campus culture and environment of a, a living campus where students live on campus. Now, of course, they're more expensive than we are. But if students are planning to ultimately get a four-year degree, then maybe they'd like to start on NC State. So we have some competition in terms of two years degrees. And no, they don't offer an Associate of Arts degrees degree, but they offer AAS degrees. And we do have a lot of students who get there AAS degree at Wake Tech and then transfer. So we do have some competition there. Also, according to our research, uh, the appearance of a college campus both inside and out is a significant criterion in, in college selection. So they've done a survey and students tend to stay where they feel warmth and comfort in an environment that they have footing in, um, something that they feel good about in a social atmosphere again, according to the research. So if we don't address this, if we don't look into this, figure out how we can foster uh, and continue to foster, because we have made strides. I'm not trying to say that we haven't, and the transfer team is not trying to say that we haven't. But if we don't continue to build on that, if we don't continue to make a more dynamic and, uh, environment and a, uh, a, a sense of uh, community at Wake Tech on campus, then we may lose some students to these four-year colleges and universities that are popping up these two-year degrees, which could be problematic, of course, for FTE and uh, other apparent obvious reasons. So those are our strategic issues. And I guess we're waiting until the end for questions. Hello, everybody. I'm Lynn Kavsak, and this is Letitia Alford. We are the labor market co-leads and I would like at this point to ask our teammates in attendance today to please stand. Thank you. So we have today Emily Holliday is here, Marilyn Terrell, Karen Ray, Kate Pattison, Tara Waters. And Al Houston is not in attendance today, I don't believe. Thank you. Okay. So
so with our particular priority for labor market outcomes, what we focused on was how do students find long-term employment after graduation in jobs where they earn a living wage. And for us, long-term employment was actually described as 12 months after graduating. And a living wage was actually defined as $35,572. So with the first issue that we actually looked at, which again is uh, defined in order as the priorities that have come before us, is that how can Wake Tech expand programs and be able to maintain student growth in high demand, high wage fields when we experience high costs, insufficient resources as factors, and also be able to keep up with trends inside of the labor market. With the research that we did, uh, we actually went and did engagement sessions with the faculty, the staff. Uh, we did one with employers. And we looked at uh, many different publications as well as took a look at what was going on with our external partners and stakeholders. So with that, uh, what we discovered was that the strengths that we have um, as a college actually led us to be able to take a look at how can Wake Tech be able to expand those programs. And when looking at the strengths of what we currently have, we found that we already have programs that are closely aligned to the labor market. However, when we're looking at that particular area, uh, we have initiatives such as the Tech Hour program, which provides learners training so that at the end of that particular initiative, those learners actually have the chance to get a particular uh, job outcome after receiving that training. With that, those learners would actually be able to transition into positions that would lead to uh, in-demand technology positions, as well as have the chance to be able to uh, earn middle wage to high wage income positions. Some of the additional strengths that we have as a college are our advisory committees. With the advisory committees, what we tend to find is that they help us in being able to provide information and insights to the college so that our learners actually um, experience curriculum that leads to appropriate job outcomes, as well as give us the opportunity to make sure that whatever it is that we're developing um, training curriculum for aligns with the workforce. So those were actually strengths that we experienced. With this particular uh, priority, and focused on this particular issue, what we also found was that it was important because it aligned with the mission statement of the college. It also aligned with the goals, each one of the five goals that we have as a college. And therefore, we thought it was important based on the research that we've um, gathered. Some of the weaknesses uh, that we found with the data that we looked at based on the feedback from the engagement sessions is that over 70% of the students stated that they attend our particular college because they want to have job skills. And so with that, one of the surprising insights is that 47% of the programs at Wake Technical Community College actually offer um, training in areas that don't lead to a sustainable wage of at least $35,572. So um, when taking a look at those weaknesses, um, in addition to that, we found that the advisors as well as the faculty uh, really don't have the information they need as it relates to the labor market trends to be able to successfully provide students the guidance that they need in, able to be able to, in order for them to be able to enroll in the appropriate programs. And some of the opportunities that we have as a college is that Wake, Tech, Wake County is currently experiencing a growth in high wage, well-skilled positions. And so that is an opportunity for us to capitalize on because we're expecting that growth to continue for the next 20 years. So what can we do in order to capitalize on that opportunity? For our particular team, what we saw was that we have the chance to be able to dissolve the silos, for example, between workforce continuing education, as well as the curriculum programs that we have at the college. And this would allow us to work with the students so that we could package our programs, bundle those resources together that could actually lead to a meaningful outcome for our learners as it aligns with the workforce. In addition to that, uh, we also looked at the opportunity to be able to align more of our programs with the job market. So we have some, 
but we want to be able to expand on that opportunity so it leads to a sustainable living wage. And lastly, one of the challenges that we um, experienced in terms of looking at the data for our particular priority is being able to meet the needs of the triangle as it relates to what employers want um, for the employment area. We know that the tech area is rapidly expanding. For that, we also know that the trades are not popular with the students. We recognize that high demand programs could lead to a higher wage, and we know that employers, based on the engagement sessions that we had, actually want to have students that have more work experience. So we're actually asking the question, how can we improve those opportunities to be able to um, enhance our position in the marketplace? And lastly, with the challenges that we have in this area, we want to know how can Wake Tech actually determine uh, which programs to open, which programs to expand, and which ones might we consider closing in order to align what we have more closely with the labor market. If we don't actually address these specific issues, some of the consequences that we might face as it relates to students is that we may have decreased enrollment for employers. We may find that they are no longer seeing Wake Tech as the go-to source in order for them to increase their talent pipeline. And then for us as a college, you know, learners may end up choosing competitors over us, but those students who finance their education would have difficulty paying off any debt that they may have financed. So there's a good amount of overlap. I'm just going to touch on the highlights with, with especially our first and second strategic goal. But we know that students at Wake Tech don't necessarily make decisions, good decisions about programs that lead to sustainable wages. Also, they don't make decisions about programs that lead to jobs with above average job outlook. And um, that, um, as uh, Letitia mentioned to that 47% of graduates in all of our programs enter entry level wages and jobs below the Wake County median salary. The good news is, if you look at average salaries, so down the road apart from entry level, 86% of our programs fall above or, uh, or within that Wake County median wage. So that's really the good news about that. Um, I, I think one of our, our, our strengths is that we have a lot of programs that meet the needs of the labor market in Wake County. We know that Wake Tech, our staff and faculty, could be provided with more up-to-date, relevant information about labor market to share with students. And um, we know that there's also the need to increase interest in programs that lead to sustainable wages, particularly those high-skill, high-wage uh, job market options. The consequences of not doing anything about this strategic issue is that students that are not making informed decisions about their career pathways um, that lead to sustainable wages that their economic empowerment really diminishes. And the, the local mar labor market is ad affected ne negatively when there aren't enough graduates in high demand, high wage fields. And if you attended any one of our job fairs this year, you would see that it was definitely a job seekers market to a large degree. It's demoralizing for students to complete a degree and not be hired in their field of study. There is a negative impact on the institution when students complete programs of study and are living beyond the Wake County median salary level. And as an institution, we are doing a disservice to our students when we are unable to um, advise them on jobs with above average out outlook and sustainable wages. Our third and final strategic goal is how can programs align with employer desired credentials that labor market needs to prepare a labor market job ready student. And I, I, Letitia touched on this in several instances. It was very interesting that we found employers who wanted what we call hires straight out of college with job experience in their fields of study, which we know that's, that's, that's difficult to do. And we also know that there is a limited number of internships and work-based learning opportunities for our students that provide them with this kind of real, real world uh, work experience that employers are asking for. They also talked about soft skills, employers, and we saw this in our survey too. There seems to be a disconnect between what our students perceive as, as possessing in terms of soft skills and what employers see also. So 
opportunity there exists to make sure our graduates have the kinds of soft and hard skills that employers are, are, are looking for. In terms of strengths, we know that a lot of our programs align very closely with living wage and high labor market demands. We also know, in terms of a weakness, that some of our programs are not aligned with a living wage. Opportunities would be to educate students about uh, these opportunities and faculty and staff as well so that we can ensure our students have the right credentials to, in both continuing ed and, and workforce, continuing ed and curriculum so that our students get what they need. I think it's important to align the programs with labor market demand, which means having conversations with employers and working with those employers to to find ways for them to get, get the kind of work experience that employers are saying that they need. The consequence of not addressing this issue is that our students will not be job ready. Economic vitality may suffer. Employers will go elsewhere. Enrollment could decrease if students don't perceive the value of their education with satisfying employment and well compensated jobs. Students will lack experience that they need to get these entry level positions and students might not possess the appropriate jobs, job or soft skills to demonstrate professionalism. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Laura Bethay, team lead for the equity team. If I have team members here, I know I saw a few earlier, please stand. And <laughs> consultants, please stand. I have some consultants here, I see you. You can wave your hand, there you go. All right. Well, first I would like to just mention the working definition for equity. It is currently reflecting as Wake Tech's way of serving as a champion for the opportunity for open, to ensure the doors are open for opportunity with the goal of providing each individual the necessary resources to successfully achieve in the classroom and in our community. Keep in mind, this is our working formulating definition. So it's changing every day to some degree. Uh, our outcomes actually refer to the strategic planning goal that all students are successful regardless of their race, gender, or socioeconomic status. And I just like to highlight that less than one half of students who are enrolled at Wake Tech actually earn a credential, degree, or transfer. For low income and minority students, the rates are even less. So that's why we are focusing in on low income and priority groups with uh, minority students at this point. So in, to enclose and to lessen the gaps and the divides in these educational achievements. We have listed four strategic issues, uh, dealing with defining and expressing the need for outcomes for our students. So everything that we're geared towards deals with student success. So one thing to note that our mission, the college's mission, is to support equity through its open door policy. And in our mission, it states that opportunities are available, accessible, affordable to all adults, regardless of their age, sex, uh, status, ethnicity, religion, and so forth. So our mission already enables us to move forward with an equity-based type of mission. Also, with our mission statement, it says that we must provide support services for all adults, resources, services, community outreach for all adults. We have goals and objectives already in line that support equity, which includes student success, workforce development, diverse learning needs, resources, community resources, and this is all reflected through online, lifelong learning, economic and cultural needs assessments. Mandates that are set forth deals with SACS, as we know, uh, dealing with student support services, student rights, and so forth. The North Carolina Community College System also has enacted a North Carolina Student Success Center. With the center, there are initiatives at the helm dealing with minority male success initiatives, Carolina Works, which is first in the world projects, 
and Research and Performance Management Division. So all of this is already at the table. To address this need to publicly express equity concerns, we must now know that equity is at the table. So it is a part of our strategic plan at this point. Uh, the college is openly acknowledging systematic gaps of opportunity and student success. So that's all at the table as we are here today. Uh, opportunities. So since mandates are at the forefront at this time, the doors are open for us to align programs, internal and external, to support equity-based initiatives. So this is dealing with federal, state, local partnerships that can be enacted. Uh, there is actually a lack of a clear perceived definition of what equity really means. So at large, we may uh, overlap equity with equality, with diversity, and it may not have the effect that we need to to move our initiatives forward. Some consequences of not actually defining and expressing the need for our outcomes for students, the gaps of enrollment, retention, completion will further deepen. Uh, enrollment rates may decline because of lack of resources for our students. Students may go into a pool for other institutions, as has been mentioned before, to continue uh, with their services. And failure to publicize and define our goals and outcomes may alienate the community at large. Strategic issue number two deals with how can we make a change, Wake Tech, in these outcomes for students. So going back with a lot of research with the EAB, with the North Carolina Community College System, our own internal data, it all shows that there are disparities that exist for low income and minority students, with African American males falling shorter on that track. And that's across the board dealing with measures of race, gender, socioeconomic status, despite efforts to actually engage and support students in these categories. Uh, let's go a piece of data here. The progression rate over a five-year period here at Wake Tech was about 44% for African-American males in comparison to 66% for Hispanic males and 69% for Caucasian males. So that's just one bit of data there. Some strengths, though, that we embody as a college, we're demonstrating that we want students' voices at the table uh, we want uh, our internal and external partners at the table with this strategic planning process with our engagement groups and surveys. We have resources, targeted programming, initiatives already at the table dealing with all types of needs and assessments, including Pathways Male Mentoring Services, our advocacy and student support, our food pantry, all of the centers, ILC, STEM, THINK, and so forth. And we have the availability of institutional and system-wide data to support any and every action that we're taking. Weaknesses that exist, however, we do have some weaknesses, even though the funding is available, are we really targeting all the needs of the populations at hand? And also, there were issues to come up um, in several surveys and, and engagement sessions about the change in leadership and how uncertainties may be at the table we're really considering equity as a priority. And we're talking about leadership, division-wide, uh, department-wide, as well as presidential. Uh, some opportunities, we have the data to support everything that we're doing here, and our challenges are that technically we're stretched to some degree and may be limited in the funding and resources with personnel to pursue other initiatives. Consequences for not addressing this issue, Again, we go back to a decline in student enrollment and retention and in being in competition with competing institutions, a deep economic income gap for those who do persist, leading to a slower economic growth in Wake County and surrounding areas. We move on to number three, evoking change for staff and faculty in this process. And the key here is that we must navigate this process through intentional freight conversations, programming, and training for all faculty and staff. And so the awareness is vital in the historical uh, context of exclusion and inclusion, uh, recognizing overall systematic needs that need to be addressed. Some of the internal strengths, though, that we possess, 
we're at the table, we're talking about these issues. Uh, we have the institutional data to capture uh, inequalities present at the college to enlighten our faculty and staff. Our current college benchmarking, applied benchmarking programs are targeted on best practices for equity focused areas. Our executive leadership supports our time invested in addressing these concerns outside of our primary duties. Some other internal weaknesses are our multi-campus setting that was mentioned before, opens the door to limited communication, silos among different departments. Um, even though it's a new initiative, equity has always been at the table to some degree, but with a new philosophy comes resistance to change. So that is also a weakness there. It goes a little deeper here with staff and faculty representation. So it's not reflective in some departments, divisions, uh, as those that are in programs. So our student base is not reflective in our faculty and staff base. Opportunities though, since we are an extension, employees are an extension of our larger community, addressing these issues and being advocates for equity spill over and ripple into the larger community. Consequences for not addressing the issue, uh, the perception of the college's true intentions. What does this college really mean? What do they really stand for? And systematic processes to meet students' need. All of this may be in jeopardy or in question. The silos may impact negatively our internal communication. Employee retention and recruitment may be negatively impacted. And employees may view that there's a lack of direction, support of equity issues, and may desire to seek employment elsewhere. The last strategic issue, how do we sustain this work? So all of our work must align with quality-based education and programming. So we have to have an equity-minded uh, leadership model, develop intentional opportunities for low income and student success. So how do we address these issues? Currently with the resources and programs that we do offer, as I mentioned before, the centers and student services support systems, but we also engage in intentional targeted recruiting practices to bring more diverse candidates to the table, more diverse students to the table. And also look here with the weaknesses we have to address the lack of coordinated efforts. How do we support long-term initiatives if we don't coordinate at the table? We embrace an all-encompassing mission, which is definitely combined with decreased funding, with initiative fatigue, with stretched employees. So how do we bring all of that to the table to address our concerns? The opportunities, now is the time, now is prime time for us to uh, engage with other institutions, industry, with our community at large in order to design a well-designed, established equity and inclusion diversity related program. Also, a challenge can be here listed, gaining buy-in from the greater community. So because we say so, we have to lead by example with an equity mindset. Not addressing those sustainability issues we may fall short of the desired stakeholders outcome for long-term support and training. Divides become deeper with the inability to manage, monitor, and analyze our college data, policies, procedures that are in place. And then we look to how can we actually benchmark and move forward with these initiatives. That concludes number four. on to questions, I did want to recognize some other teams that did a lot of work in order to provide the um, core teams with the data they have and the support they have. So um, I'd like to recognize first the data team. Uh, Kai Wong called, led that team with me. Uh, uh, Karen, you were part of that team. Who else? Uh, John Boone, part of that team. John Bakken uh, and uh, Brandy McCullough are all part of the data team and feeding this data into uh, uh, the teams as they requested. I also want to recognize the uh, research and evaluation team uh, led by Doug Hummer. Uh, Doug 
uh, did research, evaluation, assessment, and then he uh, pinched hit with facilitation help as well. Uh, but Doug, you want to go ahead and introduce your team. Uh, he, he handled all this, the coding for the surveys, all the surveys, all the data, all of the non-numeric data went to his team. Go ahead, Doug. Well, sure. I have, I have team members here. Why don't you guys go ahead and stand up? Uh, Chris. Well, um, 